But I'd like to move on to the real meat of what we're going to talk about today, and that is your academic life, and especially how to get started in your academic life. Because again, as I said before, you are now faced with so many choices, and um, I know all the Barnard students in here, because you are Barnard students, that means you are intrepid explorers. So I know that you have probably already delved into the websites of both Barnard and Columbia, and you've probably seen that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of classes that are out there. I will tell you why there are only dozens and dozens and dozens in your first year guide. Um, but you are probably thinking, you know, where do I start in all of this and how do I make the best start? So that's what we're going to talk about today. How can you form this plan that we talked about to get yourself started for when you will step onto campus? So I'll start to refer to pages in the guide um, that you may have seen, but I'd just like to emphasize a few things or expand on a few things. And the first is in the middle of the book. The first part of the book is dedicated to a little bit of orientation and then a, a large overall description of what it's like to move through Barnard and what you will need eventually to earn your Barnard degree throughout the years. But in the middle of the book, starting on page 24, it starts to talk more about how do you get started with that or what do you need to plan. And so the very first thing you'll notice, and the very first thing that I've emphasized on the screen behind me, is that we really strongly encourage all new students at Barnard to take four academic classes. And probably all of the students in the room right now are thinking, well, that's nothing. Because I know that most of you have six, seven, eight, even nine classes in your current schedules. But most students, um, by far, uh, who are new students at Barnard, find that the kind of work that they're doing in their Barnard and Columbia classes is so new, so differently paced, um, of, of such a distinct character from what their high school work has been, even if you are coming from a, a, a very um, sort of high-powered um, college prep high school, it can still be a lot to get used to what a college classroom is like and what a schedule of college courses can be like. Because as many of you probably know, the schedule alone is very different. Instead of classes every day a week during a whole long block of time, you're going to have classes that meet every other day, every few days. You're going to be spending much, much less time in a classroom and much, much, much more time outside of class preparing for those class meetings, lectures, seminar discussions. And that can take a lot of getting used to. You might only be in class twice a week for 75 hours, oh, 75 hours, 75 <laughs> minutes at a time. It's really intense. Um, <laughs> but you may have to read about 150 pages during the week for those two short lecture or seminar sessions. So just finding out how to juggle the amount of classwork that you will have outside of class can take a lot. Also, the schedule itself can be such a different kind of feel for most people because typically a high school student goes to school during the day and then after school is over that's extracurricular time and then in the evening it's time for dinner and family and homework. Here all of that may turn, be turned upside down. You may have a Monday on which you have a class that meets at 10 a.m. and is over at 11.30 and then you don't have another class until 4. And you may find that the club you belong to meets at 10 o'clock on Monday night because that's the, excuse me, that's the only time that people can get together when they're not in class. So this may throw your, your typical expectations of when you do homework, when you socialize, kind of on their head. And you may have to figure out how to get work done in the morning, um, which you may not be used to. Or you might have to um, figure out when to schedule dinner at a different time of the day than you might be used to. So that can take uh, a few months just to kind of get the hang of and just to know that you are in that rhythm in a way that's comfortable to you. So students find that four classes is usually plenty to help them get started, to help them feel that they're not only getting used to it, but doing well, you know, having a strong foundation before they, it's going to be so tempting for you as you see the number of interesting classes available for you to say, well, I, I need to take at least a dozen, because how am I going to fit in the hundreds of interesting classes I want to take before I graduate if I don't take a million now? And, but, but I do think that it's so, such a better experience overall if you get a really strong start and feel confident moving forward and, and, and then bite off more and more um, as you feel ready for the challenges and, and know that you're ready for them. So those four classes uh, could be very different. This is something else that could be new. As we were saying before, most high schools have a pretty strict schedule of what kinds of courses you need to be taking. This first year of college, there's only one class each semester that all students will have to take. Other than that, your schedules could be as different as there are a number of students in this room. Um, in terms of the variety, even in four classes, the number of classes available to you and that you could construct your program from 
is really varied. And you could take a science and a math class, or you could decide to put those off until sophomore year. You could uh, take a second language, or you could decide to explore in something that you've never even really heard of before. So this is going to depend a lot on you, what your plans are, what you really should take if you have certain plans, or what you could take if you just want to explore. Um, this can depend on whether you're the kind of personality who needs to know that you're fulfilling certain requirements earlier, or whether you really want to embrace the varied curriculum that you're now a part of in a liberal arts curriculum and save some requirements for later. All of those different types of approaches can be accommodated in a Barnard education, and that's one of the things that makes it such a wonderful place, is that you have um, so many varied paths to achieve the same kind of education. So I want to talk first about this required class, because it is the one that every student in the, class, in, this, in the room will have to take at some point, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how you can think about what other kinds of classes you individually may want to choose. Um, I, ha I have indicated on the screen, you'll notice that when I'm talking about four classes, I'm talking about academic classes, things that are three points of credits or more, those things that we would consider the academic need. If you do want to take something that is an additional um, sort of enrichment element of your program, say there's a one-point class that's pass-fail that builds on your interest in biology, or if you would like to take a dance class or a PE class toward your PE requirement, or if you're a musician and you want to be in the orchestra, or if you want to be part of a the theater performance and be back in this fantastic theater space or something like that, and there's something available for credit, you could think of that as an additional element of your program. That wouldn't necessarily be your four academic classes, that would be something additional. But when we're talking about academic classes, we really do strongly encourage the four. So this required class is going to be one of two first year foundation classes. So if you would continue to turn your page of your guide, you'll see that on page 26, it starts to talk about these classes in some detail, because like I said, this is a class that all of you are going to take. Um, so I just want to say a few words about why this is such an important class in your program as a first-year student. Um, these classes are designed to be what we call seminar classes. And a seminar, sometimes you'll see as in first-year seminar, it is part of the title, but a seminar is a format of class, it's a type of class. And it's a class in which the size is limited. You sit around a table, many of you may already be experiencing something like this in your high schools, but you're sitting around a table with the professor, and the content of the course certainly depends on the reading list you have, the expertise that the professor is bringing in to help guide you, but a lot of the content that you create, the knowledge you create for the semester, is what you bring to the discussion, what happens around that table, what you say in response to the questions that the professor asks you, what you each observe about the things that your classmates are saying, what you share, what kind of questions you raise, what helps keep moving the conversation forward. And so that anytime we talk about a seminar class, we're talking about something of that format. Both of these classes, first year English and first year seminar, are in that format. This would be in contrast to, say, a lecture class. And many of you may have in your minds what a classic sort of lecture class would look like in college. In fact, it probably looks a lot like this, right? I'm talking at you, you're being very patient and attentive. Um, and sometimes you might find a lecture class has some room for discussion, but often you will just be hearing about information um, and, and ideas from a professor. But a seminar is about you and your contributions and how you all build a body of knowledge together, and so first year English and first year seminar are designed to make sure that brand new students to Barnard get the opportunity to experience this, get the opportunity to be introduced to this and be coached through this by a professor who's there to dedicate themselves to the first year experience, who's there to help you um, develop your skills in a kind of discussion that may be new to you. There's going to be a lot of emphasis on writing in a way that may be new to many of you. And so you're going to be asked to write in an argumentative way, in a critical way, in an analytical way that may need some practice. And so you're going to be asked not only to write essays, but to revise them, to get certain kinds of feedback, to meet with your professors outside of class, and to really learn what this probably new form of, of writing for college is about. And so in some ways, these two classes are going to feel pretty similar because they're both designed in, in many ways to introduce you to the college culture, to college level work, college level writing, and to help you build confidence in this seminar experience. Because many of you may find that this is the main seminar experience you will have first year because many of our introductory classes are by necessity quite large. 
They're not only for people who need to have foundational work to move on to uh, advanced coursework, but they're also for people who are fulfilling requirements or things like that. So for example, if any of you are thinking about taking biology or chemistry during your first semester, that's going to be quite a large lecture, 150 students perhaps in some cases. Introduction to Art History is going to be a very large lecture class. But we want to make sure that at least one of your classes, if not more, is this small seminar format class that really helps you feel that you are building your confidence and getting settled into being a student at Barnard and Columbia. So I'd like to talk about both, just to make sure that they're pretty clear, and also to clarify what your choices may be. And we do need to place every single first year student into one of these courses, and in order to make sure we fit everyone, that means that half of the first year class will take one type of course, then the other in spring. So half of you will take first year English first, and then first year seminar in the spring. The other half of you will do it in reverse. You'll take first year seminar, and then first year English. They're not obviously sequential, so there's not an advantage to one or the other, but you as a student may have a preference based on some of the information that we're going to give you today and some of the details. So I'm gonna offer you some things that you might think about um, to consider if you have a strong preference as to which one to take first, you don't have to have a strong preference. Um, and also, I'll let you know a little bit about what happens in the spring in case that influences what you're thinking about for this first semester. So I'll start with first year English. And as you'll see on page 26, first year English has three topics. And first year English is kind of what it sounds like. It's situated in the English department. It's taught by professors in the English department. And it's based around a reading list that is mostly literary in nature. The works of literature, each in a literary tradition that's defined by its topic. There's a little bit of interdisciplinary um, contextual reading in there. But most of it is literature from these three different traditions. The traditions are um, interesting in that they're building on what may be considered more traditional ideas of these literary traditions, and yet they're trying to complicate the discussions to really um, encourage students to think perhaps more carefully, perhaps more distinctly than they have before. For example, the Americas. A lot of times when we think of American literature, we may be thinking of what's really United States literature. The Americas is, is saying, what happens if we look at what was being written in the United States alongside of what was being written in Latin America and really think about what they're saying that is remarkably similar or remarkably distinct, especially since they are all going through kind of similar large historical uh, shifts having to do with exploration, colonization, revolution, where can we find interesting points of discussion? And this is the lens that you'll use to also think about writing and how you write about um, these works. Legacy of the Mediterranean is, in many ways, a kind of traditional great books course. It starts with the ancient Greek text, you start with Homer's Odyssey, you move through some Greek tragedies and comedies, um, you'll hit then on Dante's Inferno, you'll see some of the list, Dante's Inferno, it's Shakespeare, but again, we try to complicate the discussion about great books by adding some things in there, in there that are certainly well known within specific fields, but aren't always within a great books curriculum, just to kind of raise the question, what makes a great books reading list that reading list? Who determine it? What happens if we look at some other things that were being written around the same time? What kind of questions does that raise? So for example, you'll see um, the Book of Marjorie Kemp, who was a medieval mystic who was writing some really wild stuff and can kind of um, throw into relief some interesting things about the other works surrounding it. And then finally, Women in Culture also starts with the ancient Greeks and moves up through a sort of early Renaissance uh, period, but obviously is looking at things through a certain lens. And many of you may be coming to Barnard very precisely because it's a women's college and you may be very intent on figuring out what that means to you. Some of you are coming to Barnard despite the fact that it's a women's college, and I know you're out there, I won't point fingers. Um, but whether or, not that that, whether or not that has proved to be a major part of your selection of Barnard, this may be an interesting class just to raise questions about what does it mean? Whether or not it's something that's uh, in the front of your mind or not, you might want to know what it means to be thinking about a place where gender is very much a conscious part of, of what we do. And so the reading list here asks questions like that. Again, looking at some works that would be uh, traditionally in a great books course, but some that may not, kind of looking at how gender is treated in those books. So each one of these, as I said, is a kind of literary tradition, and each one of them is using literature as a lens through which to encourage discussion and through which to um, form the basis of your writing. But I do want to make it clear that the writing that you're learning in this class, because this really is about, um, really an emphasis on essay writing for college, is not 
limited to an English class. You're not learning how to write an essay that is only for the English classes that you will take in the future. It's really about how to approach any kind of text, any kind of written work, um, in a critical way, in an analytical way, in an argumentative way, and how to have a point of view about it, how to uh, support that point of view logically, carefully, thoroughly, in detail, and eventually how to engage that with um, research, and how to, uh, you will move on to a large research paper where you're going to be asked to engage with scholarly texts and try to figure out not just how to summarize them, but how you engage with them, how you take your own ideas and consider how they interact with the ideas you're reading about, which is pretty sophisticated stuff. So first year English emphasizes this essay writing component. And the fact that it does culminate in a research paper where you're walked through the different stages, you are um, given a tour of the library, you have a reference librarian um, showing you how to use databases and showing you how to do sort of advanced research and go through different drafts of the research paper. For some people, this is a point of preference right away. They'd like to have that experience sooner than later. It's fine for you to do this second semester. Many of you may not use some of these research skills in other classes until you move into advanced work. So there's no disadvantage. Uh, obviously, half of the first year class will be doing this second semester. But if some of you are eager to know that you have that experience under your belt by the end of the first semester, that may be a preference for you and a reason why you'd like to take first year English first semester. But there's one other thing I want to let you know about First Year English that may also have something to do with your preference. And that is, if you look again at these reading lists, you'll notice that they all end at a, at a point of time that is still rather in the distant past. The Americas um, ends around 1830 or so. Legacy of the Mediterranean Women and Culture both end somewhere around the Renaissance. If you were to take First Year English in the spring, each of these topics is still um, the choice that you would have, but they all start at that late, at that um, time period, and then move forward. So in other words, the Americas will pick up in the 1830s and go into the 20th century. Like the Mediterranean, where the culture will pick up in the Renaissance and move into the 20th century. So again, that may prove a point of interest for you right away. If you're somebody who says, you know, I've always wanted to read Dante's Inferno, I've never done it, this is my chance, I want to take Legacy of the Mediterranean in the fall. That's great. If, on the other hand, you're somebody who's dying to read Virginia Woolf or who's dying to read 20th century American literature, that may mean that you want to take first year English in the spring. I do want to point right now to the first year blog because this is something that has been posted recently, um, just yesterday in fact. If you were to look at the post from yesterday, it directs you to a link. If you were to click on this link, it will take you to the Reinventing Literary History website. Reinventing literary history covers all these topics in that way that I was describing where these kind of uh, literary traditions are being complicated, or reinventing, if you will. And you can go to, say, the Legacy of the Mediterranean site, go to Course Information, and at the top you'll see a rough uh, list of the same courses that you will find. In fact, what's in the first year guide is slightly more detailed, but you'll see basically the, the text that you would hit. If you continue to scroll down the page, you'll actually see the text that you would read in the spring. So you may want to check this out and just see if the reading list would be a point of preference for you in terms of whether you'd like to take first year English in the fall or the spring. We can typically accommodate that request if you would rather take it earlier or later.